Hey friends, if you have not been watching my recaps of E.L. James's The Misses, um, good for you. That's a fantastic choice. It's just me screaming in rage. But uh, you will not have seen that uh, I'm finally getting reunpacked and I have books, but they're not all here. So um, there'll be more books behind me. But I thought this would be nice for when I'm doing book videos, I can be in front of books. And also that way you don't see all of the boxes that are over there in my office, just, just cluttering the place to fuck up. Yeah. We are reading Britney Spears, The Woman in Me. This is part three of our little um, read along. There's only going to be four parts of our read along. We are reading to chapter 36 today. Um, so there we go. Uh, <laughs> I feel really bad for Brittany because I feel like her idea of parenthood or of motherhood is the same idea that a lot of us had before we had children. And it's an unfair thing because she says, I know you're supposed to focus only on being a mother at those times, but it was hard for me to sit down and play with them each day to put being a mother first. That's absolutely like, it, that was one of the things where I was like, shouldn't I want to play blocks for like hours and hours? No, no, I, I really don't feel like it. I, I, and, and I felt like a bad mom. I felt terrible. It's really weird to me too, that like she and I were moms at about the same time. Like I was very young when I had my kids. She was young when she had her kids. And that feeling, that pressure feeling, I feel like I'm transported back to you know, I loved, I'm not saying that all of my memories of, of my kid's childhood was like bad, but those feelings of inadequacy and like, I'm not doing it right because I'm not obsessed with, I'm not fulfilled only. I need other things. I need friends. I need outside things. And therefore I'm a failure is kind of what it sounds like. She says, what I can see now, but couldn't see then, is that every part of normal life had been stripped from me. Going out in public without becoming a headline, making normal mistakes as a new mother of two babies, feeling like I could trust the people around me. I had no freedom and yet also no security. At the same time, I was also suffering, I know now, from severe postpartum depression. I'll admit it, I felt like I couldn't live if things didn't get better. So that's, oh my gosh. We went through the same things that that postpartum depression, that feeling of like, I mean, yeah, I couldn't go out in public because I was, you know, in the house and we were didn't have money and I we only had one car and I was kind of just like stuck there. That's a lot different than I can't go out because I'm so super famous. But still, I understand the, the being trapped in the house, the not feeling fulfilled just by playing blocks. Um she felt she feels like she's being watched everywhere and she really was justin and kevin were able to have all the sex and smoke all the weed in the world and no one said one word to them i came home from a night at the clubs and my own mother tore into me it made me scared to do anything my family made me feel paralyzed um she says that she would start to just sort of glom on to anybody who would step in between her and her family just so that she would have some sort of like like padding there between the two of them or the, not the two but between her and you know her family she says that um while he was trying to get custody kevin started talking to everybody about how Brittany was out of control she was crazy she shouldn't have the kids she couldn't take care of the kids um, she should never have the kids and she was thinking like this has to be just for the tabloids right because she says that she assumes that what you read in celebrity magazines are things that are being fed to them um, and she felt like you know like to get the upper hand against other people so she said she was just waiting for him to bring the kids back um, so I kept waiting for him to bring the boys back to me after he took them. He not only wouldn't bring them back to me, he wouldn't let me see them for weeks on end. So these are very small children and their dad is basically like cutting off all visitation with their mom. She is so depressed and then her aunt who she loves dies 
and she doesn't have her kids. She doesn't feel like working. She just, she just, she says she feels worn down. In February, after not getting to see the boys for weeks and weeks, completely beside myself with grief, I went to plead to see them. Kevin wouldn't let me in. I begged him. Jaden James was five months old and Sean Preston was 17 months old. I imagined their not knowing where their mother was, wondering why she didn't want to be with them. And this was uh, the infamous night. The night. The paparazzi watched it all happen. I can't describe the humiliation I felt. I was cornered. I was out being chased, like always, by these men waiting for me to do something they could photograph. And so that night, I gave them some material. I went into a hair salon, and I took the clippers, and I shaved off all my hair. So, um, she says that everybody was, like, making jokes about it, and she's crazy, her parents were embarrassed. She says, but nobody seemed to understand that I was simply out of my mind with grief. My children had been taken away from me. So she feels like when she did that, it made people like afraid of her. Um, and I think that that was basically the case. Like, I feel like that was the moment where everybody went from like, oh, Brittany's a train wreck. Brittany's a train wreck to like, oh, shit, there's something really wrong here. My long hair was a big part of what people liked. I knew that. I knew a lot of guys thought long hair was hot. Shaving my head was a way of saying to the world, fuck you. You want me to be pretty for you? Fuck you. You want me to be good for you? Fuck you. You want me to be your dream girl? Fuck you. And if you think about it, yeah, she has just been marketed as a sex symbol since she was a child. So shave your head. Shave your head. Um... She says that, like, you know, she was out there doing this, being this sex object, having men stare at her, being harassed by people on, you know, TV shows, having people say that, you know, her sensuality and her sexuality was corrupting children, and she's still selling tons of records but her family thinks she's not good enough she was just at a low point a friend of mine once said if someone took my baby away from me i would have done a lot more than get a haircut i would have burned the city to the ground same um chapter 26 she says that she's still losing it um she moved out of her house uh, and into, um, she says, a random English-style cottage in Beverly Hills. The paparazzi were always around. Um, she bought wigs thinking that she would wear them out when she would go out and then people like wouldn't recognize her. And uh, instead, she just didn't go out because she just wanted her kids. Um, her cousin comes and takes her to Kevin's and she's thinking that because she's with her cousin they're not going to figure out that it's her going there but obviously somebody tips off the paparazzi when we stopped at a gas station the pair of them came for me they kept taking flash pictures with a giant camera and videotaping me through the window as I sat heartbroken in the passenger seat waiting for Allie to come back one of them was asking questions how are you you doing okay I'm concerned about you and I know that I know exactly that guy um, because he's done interviews and stuff. And I've always wondered how sincere, like from her point of view, she owes him no grace. I don't care. She owes him zero grace. But I've always wondered if like he was actually having just from that clip and from the tone of his voice and the way he said, like, I'm worried about you. I kind of have wondered if at that moment he wasn't having some kind of epiphany or some kind of like, oh, what I'm doing is not good. Like, he didn't put the camera down, but it just, to me, when I've seen it before, I've been like, it, it seems like that guy is having a moment. Like I said, Brittany does not need to extend him the grace of wondering that. 
her experience is exactly what she experienced. And I'm not saying that she needs to like think of it that way or anybody should just like give the paparazzi a chance. But I feel like in that particular instance, I really have wondered if that guy um, actually was having a moment of self-reflection, um, just having seen that. And this is um, her experience with that guy. They go to Kevin's. Those two paparazzi follow them, take pictures when she's turned away and can't see her kids. And then this is what happens. That guy that I said maybe he was having a moment then says, What I'm going to do, Brittany, all I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you a few questions, one of them said with that mean look on his face. He wasn't asking if he could. He was telling me what he was going to do to me. And then I'm going to leave you alone. That's powerful. He was telling me what he was going to do to me. And this is someone who that's been happening her entire life. That's just what people do is they tell her what they're going to do to her. So um, I, I get the feeling that that's the same guy. But um, uh, so, I mean, obviously he didn't have that moment of clarity or whatever or if he did he pushed it down for money so that's it kind of answers my question it, it answered my question the first time around I'm still I'm still on the fence because I've heard that before and he really did sound like he he was good at pretending I mean maybe he went to LA to be an actor and it didn't work out and he made more money uh, as a paparazzi so her cousin is just begging like leave us alone leave us alone and finally, Brittany, like, freaks out because she says that they love it when when she reacts. They, they get that reaction. One guy wouldn't go away until he got what he wanted. He kept smirking, asking me the same terrible questions over and over, trying to get me to react again. There was so much ugliness in his voice, such a lack of humanity. That was, this was one of the worst moments of my whole life, and he kept after me. Couldn't he treat me like a human being? Couldn't he back off? But he wouldn't. He just kept coming. He kept asking me over and over again how I felt not being able to see my kids. He was smiling. And that is when uh, she takes the umbrella and jumped out of the car. And she, when she got the umbrella and jumped out of the car, she's like, even at my worst, I'm not ever going to hit somebody, is her thing. She's just like, I am, I'm not going to hit this guy with an umbrella. But she started wailing on his car with the umbrella. And she was really embarrassed when that happened. And she wrote a note apologizing to the this photographer's agency like how do you how how this is the problem with this angel is she is too sweet and people take advantage of her she wrote a note to say she was sorry for doing zero damage to this guy's car when he was attacking her at one of her lowest points later that paparazzo would say in an interview for a documentary about me that was not a good night for her, but it was a good night for us because we got the money shot. I'm kind of wondering if I saw that documentary. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But that was... This whole part of this book is so hard. Like, from here on out, friends, part three and part two, four are going to be an experiment in terror because that's just how her life has been. In chapter 27, she goes to see her brother in Los Angeles, and her, her mom is there, and she said that her mom wouldn't even look at her with the shaved head. Um, and she was like, well, that just kind of proves that, like, nobody, everybody only just cares about my appearance. They don't care about me. That winter, I had been told it would help me get custody back if I went to rehab. And so, even though I felt like I had more of a rage and grief problem than a substance abuse problem, I went. When I arrived, my father was there. He sat across from me. There were three picnic tables between us. He said, you are a disgrace. Your daughter is not on drugs and you're sending her to rehab so she can try to get custody of her kids. The thing that's making her act so erratically is being separated from her kids because her ex-husband, who is a total 
shit pile is telling everybody that she's crazy. I'm sorry, but it's like that thing where people say like, oh, my ex-girlfriend was crazy. And the first thing you think is, what did you do to make her crazy? That is what's happening to Britney. He is making her crazy. She says that it feels like he's treating, like her dad was treating her like an ugly dog. Um, but she feels like one of the positives of rehab was that she was able to deal with some of her emotions and stuff. Now we are at the 2007 VMAs. We are the night of the Gimme More performance. There was a problem with my costume and with my hair extensions. I hadn't slept the night before. I was dizzy. It was less than a year since I'd had my second baby in two years, but everyone was acting like my not having six-pack abs was offensive. I couldn't believe I was going to have to go out on stage feeling the way I felt. I ran into Justin backstage. It had been a while since I'd seen him. Everything was going great in his world. He was at the top of his game in every way, and he had a lot of swagger. I was having a panic attack. I hadn't rehearsed enough. I hated the way I looked. I knew it was going to be bad. But guess what? She went out there and she did it. And it makes me furious. If you have not watched that performance in a while, go back and look at it. Do you remember how everybody said she was fat? Go back and look at it. Go back and see how fat Britney Spears was in 2007 during her performance of Gimme More at the VMAs, knowing that she had two babies in two years. Go back and look at how grotesquely fat she was and everyone mocked her for it. I'm not going to defend that performance or say it was good, but I will say that as performers, we all have bad nights. They don't usually have consequences so extreme. You also don't usually have one of the worst days of your life in the same exact place and time that your ex has one of his best. That's a lot. She's about to get divorced. Her very first love is there. He's having an amazing time. Everyone in the world is shitting on her. He started the shit fest. He, it's his fault that everybody decided to start shitting on her and thinking she was terrible because he was like, oh, cry me a river. Ugh justified. I hate Sarah Silverman. I've always gotten bad vibes from Sarah Silverman. Sarah Silverman has never passed a single goddamn vibe check with me ever, and this makes me hate her even more. So, Sarah Silverman, you're not funny, and I hope you stub your toe every day of your life. Later that night, the comedian Sarah Silverman came out on stage to roast me. She said that at the age of 25, I'd done everything worthwhile in my life I'd ever do. She called my two babies the most adorable mistakes you'll ever see. I didn't hear that until later, though. At the time, I was backstage sobbing hysterically. Hey, you know who else can get fucked? In the days and weeks that followed, the newspapers made fun of my body and my performance. Dr. Phil called it a train wreck. Fake-ass quack. She goes out to do press for Blackout for that album, which, by the way, is a fucking amazing album, and it is to date. Blackout is my favorite Britney album. There is not a skippable song. I skip other Britney songs. I do not skip a single song on Blackout. That is my favorite of all of her albums. So she goes to see Ryan Seacrest for a live radio interview. Guess what? Guess what? Ryan Seacrest, you can also get fucked. You can take your great big giant teeth and go get fucked. In the interview, which was supposed to be about the record, Ryan Seacrest asked me questions like, how do you respond to those who criticize you as a mom? And do you feel like you're doing everything you can for your kids? And how often will you see them? It felt like that was the only thing people wanted to talk about, whether or not I was a fit mother. Not about how I'd made such a strong album while holding two babies on my hip and being pursued by dozens of dangerous men all day, every day. Her management quits. Her bodyguard uh, is a witness in the custody case and says that she was doing drugs. It's never questioned. Um... And then she says, a court-appointed parenting coach said that I loved my children and that we were clearly bonded. She also said there was nothing at all in my home that could be called abuse. But that part didn't make headlines. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. 
I can't imagine. I remember feeling every single day of my life like I was failing at raising my children and the thought of the entire world. It felt when you are a new mom, it feels like the entire world hates you and thinks you're doing everything wrong. And in this case, the entire world was telling her that. So it's January of 2008. She has visitation with her kids and um, a security guard comes to pick them up. Someone who used to work for her, but then, you know, hitched his wagon to the K-Fed star. First, he put Preston in the car. When he came to get Jaden, the thought hit me. I may never see my boys again. Given how things had been going with my custody case, I'd become terrified that I wouldn't get the kids again if I gave them back. So she has a total meltdown. She runs into the bathroom. She locks the door with Jaden in there with her. They call the police and they come in and break the door down. And um, yeah, that was what was all over TMZ and everything. It was all over the news. Once they'd taken Jaden from me, they tied me onto a gurney and took me to the hospital. The hospital let me go before the end of a 72 hour hold, but the damage was already done. Yeah, it was because everybody was making jokes. Everybody was making jokes about it, except for the man I love, Craig Ferguson and South Park. A new custody hearing was held and I was told that now because I'd been so scared to lose the kids that I'd panicked, I would be allowed to see them even less. It felt like no one had my back. Even my family seemed not to care. Right around the holidays, I found out about my 16-year-old sister's pregnancy from an exclusive in the tabloids. The family had kept it from me. After this happened, after she gets out of the hospital, um, she says that she was just out of control. She was taking a lot of Adderall. Um, and she starts dating a paparazzo, which is weird. She said she was fearless at this point. She was doing reckless things in her car, like like trying to like do like a donut on a cliffside road. She was she was out of control and the guy was married. <laughs> that was the other thing that she found out like, oh, he's married. I feel like this keeps happening to Brittany that like she keeps getting with men who are cheaters. So she, she admits that during this time she was out of control, that she was being reckless, that at this point she was doing whatever she could to rebel. My mom called me one day and said, Brittany, we feel like something's going on. We hear that the cops are after you. Let's go to the beach house. So she's like, I don't think the cops are after me. I don't know what you're talking about. You know, like I, because she says, I know for sure that I have not done anything illegal. Like, I don't know, Brittany, I don't want to quibble here, but possibly abusing Adderall because that is like, I think that's like, isn't that a class one? Anyway, the point being that she goes to this beach house because they, her mom is like, just, you have to, oh, come to the beach house, come to the beach house. So I went to the house with them. The photographer met me there. My mother was acting suspicious. When the photographer got there, he said, something's up, right? Yeah, I said, something's really off. All of a sudden, there were helicopters going around the house. Is that for me, I asked my mom? Is this a joke? Yeah, it's the cops. They weren't really looking for her, I guess. Um, her mom, uh, like, lured her there so the cops could come get her and take her to the hospital for an evaluation. And this is where the conservatorship starts after her mom tricks her into going to the beach house where the cops apprehend her and take her to the hospital. My father had struck up a very close friendship with Louise Lou Taylor, who he worshiped. She was front and center during the implementation of the conservatorship that would later allow them to control and take over my career. So this is, um, the person that kind of gets, and I think I may be wrong. I think that this is the same person that did a conservatorship for Lindsay Lohan. Like this woman makes her money by doing these conservatorships. 
At the time, she had few real clients. She basically used my name and hard work to build her company. That's what people do with Brittany. That's what people do to Brittany. And even though she points out she was fine, she, she was being reckless, but she points out, I'd just done the best album of my career. I was making a lot of people a lot of money, especially my father, who I found out took a bigger salary than he paid me. He paid himself more than six million while paying others close to him tens of millions more. So she's functional enough that she can make this album, that she can go out and she can make tons of money that her dad is stealing from her, but um, she needs to be in a conservatorship, I guess. So, um, they set up the conservatorship. There were two, apparently, that her dad was able to set up, which was conservatorship of the person and conservatorship of the estate. And there are two conservators. And she did not want him to be the conservator for the conservatorship of the person. Even though I begged the court to appoint literally anyone else, and I mean anyone off the street would have been better, my father was given the job, the same man who'd made me cry if I had to get in the car with him when I was a little girl because he talked to himself, and the court was told that I was demented and I wasn't even allowed to pick my own lawyer. That's another thing that is messed up. She actually did still have the right to pick her lawyer. She was told that she didn't have the right to pick her own lawyer. So some of this could have been mitigated or avoided if anyone had told her the truth, and they did not. She says that at this point, her estate was worth tens of millions of dollars, and um, therefore there has to be another conservator or whatever to take care of that. So her father and this other lawyer are the conservator of the estate. Andrew Wallet, yes, his last name is Wallet. Andrew Wallet, who would eventually be paid $426,000 a year for keeping me from my own money, I would be forced to pay upward of $500,000 a year to my court-appointed lawyer, who I wasn't allowed to replace. So, they... That's it. Like, once they've got that legally sewn up, that's it for her. We're in the conservatorship now. Here we are. I am convinced that it was all planned and that my dad and mom and Lou Taylor were all involved. TriStar was even planning to be my co-conservator. Later I learned that at the time they put me into the conservatorship on the heels of the, his bankruptcy, my dad had been financially indebted to Lou, owing her at least 40000 a lot for him, especially back then. Yeah. So TriStar, by the way, is Lou's company. I don't know if I mentioned that. But... Um, her dad owed this Lou person money, and then suddenly Lou sets up the conservatorship. Made a lot more than $40,000. Chapter 30. As everything was falling apart for me, my mother was writing a memoir. This woman. This she-devil. When I made the wrong move, it was like my mother wasn't concerned. She would share my every mistake on television, promoting her book. So she says that at this point, she actually, the word she uses is basket cases. She says that she and her siblings were basket cases um, because of what's going on. Like her teen sister is pregnant. She's in this conservatorship and has been out being reckless and all this stuff. Her brother is struggling and their mom is writing this fucking book, right? Um, she was furious. Absolutely. And she's still furious, right? I swear to God, it makes me want to cry to think about my kids going through anything hard like I was going through when they were babies. If one of my sons were going through something like that, do you think I would write a book about it? That's exactly. Look at this. These, these parents were monsters, and here's Brittany with this empathy going, I could never do this to my kids. That's because you're normal. Brittany Spears, this is because you're a normal person. You are a wonderful person. <sighs> People are being so mean. The last thing I would do would be to cut my hair into a bob and put on a tasteful pantsuit and sit down on a morning show set across from Meredith fucking Vieira and make money off my child's misfortune. Sometimes I talk trash on Instagram. People don't know why I have such anger toward my parents, but I think if they were in my shoes, they would understand. That almost makes me want to cry because 
so many people do understand and did understand then and understood that what was going on with her was not right. But, you know, like here, this whole book she tries, there are so many times in this book where she's like, you have to understand or you would understand or if this happened, maybe people would understand. And this whole book is just a scream for being understood, like, please understand me. It's very, it's hard. It's a hard read. Chapter 31. The conservatorship was created supposedly because I was incapable of doing anything at all. Feeding myself, spending my own money, being a mother, anything. So why is it that a few weeks later they had me shoot an episode of How I Met Your Mother and then sent me on a grueling world tour? Exactly. Um, that's exactly. Exactly it. They could put her to work. If she could work, why did she? Why is she in the conservatorship? If she could do all this stuff, why is she? Because people want money. She says like she's starting to realize that her dad is taking everything over and um, he's just using her to get money and that she had this big bowl of receipts in her office because she said she was a nerd that when she would track all of her spending and all of her deductions for taxes and she had this collection of receipts and she felt like that was her proof that like she could still manage things that like the fact that she had these receipts was proof that she was still taking care of her uh, of her life. I knew musicians who did heroin, got in fistfights, and threw TVs out of hotel windows. Not only didn't I steal anything or hurt anyone or do hard drugs, I was keeping track of my tax deductions. But then her dad is like, absolutely not, right? I just want to let you know, he said. I call the shots. You sit right there in that chair and I'll tell you what goes on. I looked at him with a growing sense of horror. I'm Britney Spears now, he said. Gross. What a horrible person. What an awful, awful man. Is he dead yet? I hope it's soon. Chapter 32, um, she talks more about how life is under conservatorship. Um, if she wanted to go out, there was a security team that would go and make sure that there was no alcohol, no drugs. She said not even Tylenol would be allowed at the place where they were at. Um, and she felt like in that case she was isolated because her friends wanted to see her but they would be having like these dry parties and she would go and she felt like okay well I would leave and then everything would get fun because like all the rules were gone there were the rules now when someone wanted to date me the security team who answered to my father would run a background check on him make him sign an NDA and even have him submit to a blood test oh and um her daddy said she couldn't date the man that she was dating she couldn't date him anymore. Before a date, Robin would tell the man my medical and sexual history. To be clear, this was before the first date. This whole thing was humiliating, and I know the insanity of this system kept me from finding basic companionship, having a fun night out, or making new friends, let alone falling in love. Yeah, so that is um, the point, is to drive everybody away. She says for 13 years, she didn't know that she was allowed to pick her own lawyer. The court-appointed lawyer didn't give a shit about helping her out of the conservatorship, didn't um, really seem interested in her. Why not? He was paying her. She was paying him, right? He was getting paid. He was getting money. So um, he's just like, whatever. He had no, for 13 years, did not give her any information that was helpful. She tried, like her dad would take away access to her phone and she would try to like get a burner phone or something. And she would try to get out of the situation, but she said they caught her. They always caught her. And here's the sad, honest truth. After everything I had been through, I didn't have a lot of fight left in me. I was tired and I was scared too. After being held down on a gurney, I knew they could restrain my body anytime they wanted to. They could have tried to kill me, I thought. I started to wonder if they did want to kill me. So, uh... She is just like, fine, I'll play along. <laughs> These people can kill me. These people can literally do whatever they want to me. So guess I'll just play along. Um, they told the friend of the family, Felicia, that Brittany did not want her working for her anymore. That was not true. Brittany never said that. 
It's difficult for me to revisit this darkest chapter of my life and think about what might have been different if I'd pushed back harder then. I don't at all like to think about that, not whatsoever. I can't afford to, honestly. I've been through too much. Because you can't change the past. And like she said, she had no fight. There was absolutely nothing she could do. These people used the legal system to wrench her life and her um, herself away from her and just to take, like, just to make her this object to the point that she was like, you know what, they could kill me and so I better behave myself. In my old life, I'd had freedom. The freedom to make my own decisions, to set my own agenda, to wake up and decide how I wanted to spend the day. Even the hard days were my hard days. Once I gave up the fight in my new life, I would wake up each morning and ask one question. What are we doing? And then I would do what I was told. So she said she would get up. She would do everything that they told her to, um, that security would give her meds. They would watch her take them. They put parental controls on her phone. There was nothing she could do. They made her go to bed early. Then she said she would get up and she said it was like Groundhog's Day. It was just every day was exactly the same. And she said, I did that for 13 years. 13 years. Imagine 13 years of getting up in the morning, doing absolutely everything that everyone tells you to do. You have no choice and they're giving you pills all the time. If you're asking why I went along with it, there's one very good reason. I did it for my kids. Because I played by the rules, I was reunited with my boys. That was it. I mean, like, she, they kept her kids from her, too. Like, not only was there the threat of they might kill her, she's afraid that they might kill her, but they took her kids away from her. And she had to be good and play by the rules or else she didn't get to see her kids. Within the same short period of time, I appeared on Good Morning America, did the Christmas tree lighting in Los Angeles, shot a segment for Ellen, and toured through Europe and Australia. But again, the question was nagging at me. If I was so sick that I couldn't make my own decisions, why did they think it was fine for me to be out there smiling and waving and singing and dancing in a million time zones a week? I'll tell you one good reason. The circus tour grossed more than $130 million. Lou Taylor's company, TriStar, got 5%. And I learned after the conservatorship that even when I was on hiatus in 2019 and the money wasn't coming in, my father paid them an extra minimum flat fee, so they were paid hundreds of thousands of dollars more. My father got a percentage too, plus, throughout the conservatorship, about 16000 a month, more than he'd ever made before. He profited heavily from the conservatorship, becoming a multimillionaire. My freedom in exchange for naps with my children, it was a trade I was willing to make. She is just trying to see her kids. So chapter 33, there's more about like, you know, how everybody tried to was still trying to control her. Kevin was like holding this thing with the kids over her head like, you know, oh, we can meet up and maybe I'll let you see the boys. She says that people are supposed to test their boundaries but that men have the ability to test their boundaries. Men are given the freedom to test their boundaries, whereas women aren't. Kevin was leaving me alone with two babies when he wanted to go smoke pot and record a rap song, Papa Zao, slang for big ass in Portuguese. Then he took them away from me, and he had Details Magazine calling him Dad of the Year. Mm-hmm. That was a whole... He was in a fucking magazine wearing a sweater. I'm just saying. And yet, Papa Zhao, I remember Papa Zhao. What? Oh, if you have never heard it, if you can find it, if it's, if it still exists, if it hasn't been lost to, like, time and indifference of people who don't want to listen to bad music, um, go listen to it. It's ridiculous. It's terrible. When Justin cheated on me and then acted sexy, it was seen as cute. But when I wore a sparkly bodysuit, I had Diane Sawyer making me cry on national television, MTV making me listen to people criticize my costumes, and a governor's wife saying she wanted to shoot me. I'd been eyeballed so much growing up. I'd been looked up and down, had people telling me what they thought of my body since I was a teenager. Yeah. So even though, like, she shaved her head and she felt like some freedom there by doing that, um... They were like, yep, you need to grow your hair out. You need to be working out in the gym. You are going to go to bed early. You are going to take all the pills we give you. And this is how it is. And then her dad just constantly called her fat. 
That was another, that's another charming thing about him. Um, she said she started to feel like a child robot. Basically, that anything that was about herself, um, it was completely detached from her. Like, well, who she was was completely detached from who she was in the conservatorship. She just did, she just was played by the rules. Think of how many male artists gambled all their money away. How many had substance abuse or mental health issues? No one tried to take away their control over their body and money. I didn't deserve what my family did to me. No. No, you did not deserve what your family did to you. And your family deserves to fall into a pit of poison-tipped spikes. Chapter 34, she talks about how she met Jason Trowick and how he was an agent and they ended up dating. Um, that she really felt a lot of love for him. Uh, but she was still messed up obviously. Um, her parents got back together. Uh, I guess, you know, keeping all that money in the family is a good idea. Uh, my mom seemed to love that because of the conservatorship, my dad now had a real job. They watched Criminal Minds on the couch every fucking night. Who does that? Well, I mean, I do, but I also don't have any of my children in, like, a prison of leg legal papers, and, like, I'm not robbing them. When my father told me I couldn't have dessert, I felt like it was not just him telling me, but my family and my state. Like, I was not legally allowed to eat dessert because he said no. And that's true. He's the conservator. So, yeah, she, she, if he says no dessert, no dessert. Um, she's getting better. She says that if, if she's, if she's getting better about saying no if she doesn't want to do something. But I can't believe she could eat. I honestly can't believe that after 13 years in a conservatorship, anybody could ever say no again. Like, that they wouldn't just be automatically. Like, props to her that she got that strength back. She got engaged to Jason Trowick and was like, you know what, I'd rather would just be with my kids. I just want to be single with my kids. And he resigned as her co-conservator. And I feel like she doesn't... She doesn't ascribe any motives, any bad motives to him. But I remember when this was going on in the tabloids and stuff that everybody was kind of like, mm, he's trying to get money from her. But it sounds like he didn't get money from her and he actually was there because he loved her. Um, this is what's hard to explain. How quickly I could vacillate between being a little girl and being a teenager and being a woman because of the way they had robbed me of my freedom. There was no way to behave like an adult since they wouldn't treat me like an adult. So I would regress and act like a little girl, but then my adult self would step back in. Only my world wouldn't allow me to be an adult. The woman in me was pushed down for a long time. She said the thing in the thing. She also started noticing that when they would rent studios and things, they would be, like, really shitty or dark or depressing. And she thought, like, they thought she didn't notice, but she was noticing. And she wanted to make a good album. And that was, like, her goal. That's how she gets forced into doing the Las Vegas residency. Chapter 35, she is in Vegas um, in 2013. She said that in the beginning it was great because she was thrilled to be there, um, that young people were coming to see her, and she felt so good getting this energy from the fans and stuff. Um, so she started dating a guy named Charlie Ebersole, who is a TV producer. Um, they would work out every day, and she started taking like vitamin supplements, like just supplements, right? It seemed obvious that Charlie's regimens were a good thing for me, but I believe my father started to think that I had a problem with those energy supplements, even though they were over the counter, not prescription. So he told me I had to get off them and he sent me to rehab. He sent her to rehab for vitamins. That's how much control these freaks had over her. She couldn't take vitamins to have more energy to do her Vegas residency. My God, do you know how many drugs the Rat Pack was probably doing in Vegas? So she gets out of the rehab. She goes back to her Vegas residency, 
and her dad she said no matter how much she exercised um and no matter like how much she dieted her dad was always calling her fat he put her on such a strict diet that she was begging her butler to bring her food like she was on that strict of a diet two years is a long time to not be able to eat what you want especially when it's your body and your work and your soul making the money that everyone's living off of two years of asking for french fries and being told no I found it so degrading. She said all they fed her was chicken and canned vegetables. So she felt like her body wasn't hers anymore. Um, and she gained weight. And it was probably from depression. Like, she was probably just so depressed. Either that or so starved that her body held on to every calorie. Um, she also says she's like, shocked at how people would just casually talk about her body in the media and like how everybody was just like totally fine with talking about her body even when she was younger. My family would stay in Destin, a pretty beach town in Florida, at a ridiculously beautiful condo that I bought for them and eat good tasting food every night while I was starving and working. Her sister starts to be like a great big bitch again and her mom is always like, oh, yeah, we're going, it's like, taking her sister out to go, like, to the beach house and to go buy things and spend all of her money while she's sitting in her house begging her butler for food for two years. I was given an allowance of about $2,000 a week. Keeping in mind, this woman is worth tens of millions of dollars, or was before her dad started stealing all of her money. I was given allowance of about $2,000 a week. If I wanted a pair of sneakers that my conservators didn't think I needed, I would be told no. This was despite the fact that I did 248 shows and sold more than 900,000 tickets in Vegas. Each show paid hundreds of thousands of dollars. So she couldn't even buy sneakers without asking. And she's making that kind of money for them. That's ridiculous. She tried, so she says that she went out with a friend and some dancers and she decided that she was going to pick up the tab because she, she wanted to show them that she appreciated how hard they were working and she couldn't even pay for it because there wasn't enough um, money in her allowance account to pay for the dinner. So we are on chapter 36. This is the last chapter we're going to do tonight. It's a good stopping point. Um... So chapter 36, she says, One thing that brought me solace and hope during the time when I was in Vegas was teaching dance to kids at a studio once a month, and I loved it. I taught a group of 40 kids. Then back in L.A., not far from my house, I taught once every two months. That was one of the most fun things in my life. That's really cool. I think that's really, really cool. In 2014, um, she went to court because she's like, I want to get out of this conservatorship. She went to court, asked for them to drug test her father. The judge was like, nah. Um, she mentioned the conservatorship on a talk show in 2016, but they did not air the part where she talked about the conservatorship. Um, she broke up with Charlie. Uh, she started working with new songwriters to write Glory. And that's when she met um, Hassam. So once again, Brittany starts taking over-the-counter supplements, like nutrition supplements, and her dad is like, oh, I'm sending you to rehab. But instead, he sends her to Alcoholics Anonymous. And this turns out to be probably one of his biggest mistakes. At first I resisted, but the women I met there began to inspire me. I'd listen to them telling their stories, and I'd think, these women are brilliant. Their stories were actually very, very profound. I found a human connection in those meetings that I'd never found anywhere before in my life. So she kept going to those meetings, but she noticed that there were sometimes some of the women didn't come, and they all had the choice whether or not they were going to be there, and she didn't. So that was, that was an issue. But um, it really sounds from the way that she writes about these meetings, that this was a turning point for her. She also said that she starts to feel like she's in a cult and that her dad is a cult leader. And I truly believe that that, that man could start a cult. That man could do a full Nexium. 
she wanted to miss one AA meeting to stay at home and watch a movie with her kids. And they were like, no. I'd worked so hard and kept up the schedule they set for me. Basically four weeks on, four weeks off. When I was on, I did three two hour shows a week. And on or off, I also kept the weekly schedule they set for me. Four AA meetings, two hours of therapy, and three hours of training a week, plus fan meet and greets and three shows. I am so, look, I went to Vegas and I wanted to see her in Vegas and I was going to pay, I was going to pay that $5,000 meet and greet. I was going to buy that meet and greet. I am so glad that she was not performing when I was in Vegas, that she had that time off because I would feel terrible. I would never get over how bad I feel about that. I'm about to run out of my battery. That's the end of the chapter. Like, subscribe, comment, ring the notification bell. Check out the description box and I will catch you on the flip side.